get ready to be introduced to one of the most fabulous affirmational writers I have ever known. And I have today with me Ron Skaronsky. Hey, Ron. Good morning. Good morning. And we are going to lead you through uh, the life and times and the works of an important new thought writer named Florence Scovel Shin. Uh, Ron and I are both big fans of her work, and we can't share, we cannot wait to share with you all the wonderful things that she has brought to our lives just in reading her books and, and really focusing in on the good parts of our lives and how to use spiritual natural law. So Florence is fabulous for that. For those of you who are joining me for the first time, welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. I am your host, Willa White, and this is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. So I encourage you to go on there and like and share and follow that way that you get a chance to really uh, know what's going on uh, throughout the weeks because I ha usually have a different guest on the show or we cover a different spiritual topic related to spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, and more. And I really enjoy engaging with my guests and with you, the viewers. Uh, this is year four for me and I encourage you to look back through the archive videos of the show. I've got lots of uh, great guests and great topics. I know people who binge watch it enjoy it immensely. And I recently posted again the replay of a, sh a show that Ron and I did before. He's been a guest on the show and it was uh, about missing them at Christmas. So if anybody is in need of that, just know that you, you can see it a few posts below this one on my Facebook page, missing them at Christmas. And hopefully that'll give you a bit of comfort and help you through this season. So I want to fill you in uh, about a couple of things, but first I want to introduce you to Ron Skaronsky if you don't know who he is. Uh, Ron uh, has been an ordained minister for many, many, many years. In fact, Ron was the youngest spiritualist minister <laughs> to be ordained, which I think is fabulous. So I, I don't know that we want to tell them how many years, but... <laughs> It's, it's nothing that I'm doing a lot of focusing on lately, but uh, it was, uh, I'm 64 years old and I was ordained in the National Spiritualist Association of Churches uh, at the age of 25 in 1980. So, so it was, uh, it was a couple of years ago. And that's a, a major accomplishment in many ways uh, to be able to do it that young. And there's a lot of work, especially with national Spiritualist Association of Churches to be able to get there. And so kudos to you about that. And you've since also expanded and you're now an ordained minister um, and it's a long title. So I'll let you say it, Ron. Okay. Um, <laughs> as, I, um, as I worked through many years of my devotion and, and my continued devotion to modern spiritualism, I also became very aware of what we're going to be talking about today, the new thought movement. And specifically, I had come across from time to time a uh, religious science that was founded by Dr. Ernest Holmes back in 1926 and uh, became uh, very enamored and subsequently um, just overwhelmed uh, with the teaching and uh, decided that it was something I needed to do um, as a jump point for my previous work into a, 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 a different strata of, of, uh, of endeavor. And so I uh, am now uh, uh, an ordained minister with what used to be the United Church of Religious Science. We're currently known, um, we had a name change um, as so many people do. Uh, we're now the uh, Centers for Spiritual Living. Uh, we're based out of, um, Colorado. Uh, we at one point were uh, where Dr. Holmes uh, based us in uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, and of course, those who are familiar with uh, uh, religious science, or as it's more often referred to, science of mind, uh, would probably recognize that we're still 
uh, printing Science of Mind magazine, uh, which can be got at any um, uh, what I will call a good newsstand or, or via subscription. Um, uh, so if you're ever interested in uh, learning a little bit more about New Thought, but specifically one of its more prominent branches, uh, religious science, uh, Science of Mind magazine would be an excellent, um, uh, again, jump point. Absolutely. And it's it's something that does weave together for many people who love spiritualism because Science of Mind does focus on spiritual natural law. Absolutely. It's, and that's something that's near and dear to our hearts. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. It's, um, it's a little known fact. I, I, I often kind of joke about it a bit that before the new age was, quote, the new age, uh, spiritualism and other related uh, uh, streams of consciousness were already uh, very much uh, being evolved and developed. And I, when I even started my interest in spiritualism, uh, probably at the age of 13, 14 years of age, um, I did come across this thing, this Science of Mind magazine. And and the spiritualists were utilizing it. And I thought, well, it's not an official part of the movement, but I'm wondering why is it so important? And as time wore on and, and I became interested, involved, and then uber involved. <laughs> uber involved, um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I definitely um, began to appreciate, wow, um, this is what spiritualism, when it started to evolve and called so-called natural law, this group, this new thought movement, um, not only embraced these concepts, but my God, they ran with it in such a unique and such a powerful way that I, I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't ignore it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful, uh, not only professionally, but personally, because uh, it, it has done so much for me, and I'd like to believe the people that I've, I, I serve. Yes, and I, Ron <coughs> has, has served as an ordained minister and really helped people through uh, grief times, happy times, everything. And you've been a, a lecturer and speaker here at Lilydale for many, many years. And I'm so glad that we're going to talk about this. For those of you who are just joining us today, uh, this is Wednesdays with Willa. I'm your host, Willa White, and I'm a registered medium here at the beautiful Lilydale. And I say the Lilydale because it truly is a, a, a place that deserves that. This is the world's largest center for the religion of spiritualism. And uh, Ron Skaronsky is my guest today on my show. We're going to be talking about Florence Scovelshin, who is a new thought writer, who's changed my life, uh, changed Ron's life and many other people just by reading her, her works. So we're going to be focusing today on a bit of her history and the new thought movement. And I, before we get really started at this, I have to show you my book. <laughs> Look how like, woo, <laughs> like this, I, I have to tell you guys a story here. I have post-it notes, I write in this book. Um, it's for her four books all in one in this nice little thing I have going on and uh, this goes into my big mom purse and I read this when I'm in the car uh, my husband drives I'm so thankful he's the chauffeur in the family <laughs> and uh, so I sit back I read this and my children actually request me to read this to them when we are journeying sometimes on road trips or you know if it's just an hour away and they see that I'm reading it one will pipe up and say mom read me the game of life <laughs> so you, you know I, I've got to I've got to say this I just got what I'll call a Christmas chill when you said that 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 warms my heart to you have no idea yeah. uh, to, to hear that your children actually request you to read them that rather than pokehead man or something that I'm that I can't relate to but you know they also like the bible they also like oh yeah 
they're, they're, I have to say, my, my children are pretty wholesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, my gosh. It's, it's awesome because I each time I'm surprised that they ask for it. I thought, well, maybe they'll bored with it or it's, it's like above their head somehow. But that's the magic of Florence. She is very easy to understand. And even though it's really set in that idea of, of biblical understanding, but she makes it easy for people to understand and apply in their lives. Not that my children need to apply it much, but I'm hoping that when they need it later on in their life, this is what's going to maybe be part of what sustains them. So okay. there we go. <laughs> I just had to say it. But let's tell them who Florence is, like a little well, bit about her. Let me, if if I may give just a little bit of a, a bit of a uh, bump back and, and give a shout out to someone that needs to be acknowledged in the New Thought Movement. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The father of the New Thought Movement in America is a gentleman by the name of Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, uh, Q-U-I-M-B-Y. And he was born in 1802 in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and he passed into the spirit side of life in 1866. And he fundamentally began to evolve this kind of thinking, this perspective, this uh, theory of what we call mental science, and perceived himself to be more off, <clears throat> mostly a healer. And during the course of his career, uh, worked with and healed, for lack of a better term, probably over 12,000 people. So as his teaching and, and his, uh, I'll use the word fame, kind of began, began to, uh, to, to spread, uh, we come to uh, the lady in question this morning, uh, Florence Scovel Shin. Now, she was born in, uh, on September 24th in 1871, and uh, she made her transition uh, to the spirit side of life uh, in 1958. And one of the interesting things about Florence, and you just alluded to it, is that she is probably, um, I, I'll call her in some ways, in some areas of thinking, kind of an unsung heroine, uh, unsung hero, I guess, of, of the New Thought Movement, because she was and continues to be incredibly readable, yes. and even more significant, not just readable, but comprehensible. One of the problems with anything in the field of metaphysics is that to a degree it's uh, it's another world okay and, and what i mean by that is that if you uh for example were to pick up a copy of the science of mind by dr ernest holmes which is the landmark text for the religious science movement absolutely you will open the back of that book and what will you find you will find a glossary. Now, a glossary implies that there are words in the book that you do not understand, and you need a dictionary of terms so that you will comprehend the writing. In essence, you need to learn, for lack of a better phrase, a new language to be able to comprehend the book. Right. And I, as a, as a, as a minister of, of science of mind, often tell folks who come to me and say, how can I get started? I say, the last thing you want to do is read the book, Science of Mind. <laughs> do not do it, please. Because don't hurt yourself. <laughs> what? I said, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean that fictitiously, but no, I understand it, it. You will hurt yourself. Some of these arcane texts are difficult for people to, in today's time. It's, it's not as bad as trying to read, you know, old English or anything like that. It's just that, that we have a different mindset in today's time. So I, I think your point is well made. Well, one, um, the, it, you know, to speak of, to speak of another powerful um, metaphysician, 
uh, the, the philosophical father of modern spiritualism, Andrew Jackson Davis. Uh, if you were to read his books, you would find two things. One, extraordinarily profound, spiritually and philosophically. Two, almost unreadable. <laughs> Um, and so you, you do have people who currently are working on, and, and anytime you, you have um, what I will call commentaries on a text, it's basically a polite way of saying, you'll never understand this, please let me under help you understand it. Right, but right. going back to Florence, what she was able to do when she began her, her career in writing once she started, I'm sure, studying um, the works of Quimby and, and, and I'm sure others who are beginning to, to evolve at that point in, in that point of history, was to make it comprehensible so that the average lady, the average gentleman could pick up that book, read it, and not only read it in a, in a philosophical context, but she included in the body of her work, um, quote, life examples. Um, she would talk about people who came to her for, for um, <clears throat> what we in religious science call spiritual mind treatment or a yes. mental science treatment and what, the, what they were experiencing, the challenges they were experiencing. And subsequently, what she helped them come to terms with in their consciousness so that they could change their consciousness, change their thought, and therefore change the result or the experience that they were having. Yes. Um, this is all based on the proposition that is as old as old can get. Uh, is the idea that if you if you don't like what you're experiencing, the only way to change it, in in in, or I should say, the purest, most core way to change it, is what's occurring between your two ears, what's happening in your mentality, because <clears throat> you're dealing with your conscious mind which is, you know, the facts, figures, opinions, diagnoses, uh, all of the, the things that we have accepted as reality with a small r more often than not. And then you have the unconscious mind, which is the doer, which is the, um, the automated system that basically uh, you know, you've heard that old expression, garbage in, garbage out. Well, that's what the subconscious mind does. Yes. If, it's, if your thoughts are uh, sub, uh, if your thoughts are negative, if your thoughts are uh, not progressive and, and, and wholesome, and the result will be a dynamic reflection of that. And on, conversely, if your thoughts are positive, progressive, loving, caring, compassionate, then that will produce a like effect. Going back to what I just said a moment ago, it's as old as old can be. Uh, you know, whether you call it the secret or whether you call it uh, so many other things, it is the old uh, concept, which, by the way, predates anything biblical by thousands and thousands and thousands of years yes. is that you reap what you sow and the only and you know it, it makes us all for lack of a better phrase mental farmers if you plant good seed you will receive a good harvest if you plant bad seed you will receive a less than perfect harvest. It is not a reward. It is not a punishment. But as to quote from spiritualism, it is the systematic, automatic, natural law that is in place to regulate and balance all that is. And <clears throat> when, the, when uh, Florence came to start working on it, she too, as many people in that day and age, began to realize these fundamental truths about thinking 
<coughs> excuse me, and um, subsequently began writing. Um, if you look also at the times in which she wrote, women were not, uh, and to some degree it hasn't changed much uh, in, in some quadrants of the world, but women were still not given the same equality as men. Uh, and so consequently, if you were uh, respected as a spiritual or a uh, intel uh, intellectual leader, chances are people were looking for that kind of leadership from men uh, and not so much from women. I have an interesting you... point to make about Florence in terms of that too. Please. With, with what I've read, oh, yeah. just to give people a little uh, history of this, she, she was born in, in the late 1800s. 1871. And, right. And so uh, she ended up dying in, I think, 1940. Nope. 1958. Oh, I'm I I have it as 19 1940. Um, but anyway, with with all of this, I know she was married to uh, some premier artist at the time, and they eventually did divorce. But she was an illustrator, and I, you know, so she would illustrate books, and she was an artist herself. And I think that especially because the the illustrator uh, group actually honored her as uh, being one of them before, like decades and decades before they allowed women even in their organization. So I was really excited when I read that, that Florence in, in her own career before her, I, I guess you could say her spiritual teaching career, that she did uh, have people take notice of her work. The Society of Illustrators uh, gave her an associate membership when that was unheard of in those days. Yes and, yes. and I think that because she was an artist, when she talks about visioning things, the power of thought, I think that's where she was coming from. She knew how to put uh, her thoughts onto the paper. She also knew how to put the thoughts in, manifest them in reality, in a spiritual space. So there's magic there that she understood because I think the combination of being, a, uh, you know, being around the people who would talk that way philo philosophically, reading these things, talking to people, but also her own life experience as an artist. Well, uh, that was uh, perfect. Uh, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. Dr. Ernest Holmes said, and it's, it's, it's short, sweet, but it says it all all thought is creative not some thought not most thought all thought is creative and when you have a person like florence who was able to take out of her consciousness and put on paper uh the kind of things that an illustrator um and and frankly and you know we've seen i've seen some of her work um it it can be from incredibly simplistic to uh, incredibly intricate, all of that has to be within her, the, the core of her mentality, the core of her soul, if you will. And to be able to then have that same process be able to be used and recognize that uh, as, you know, you, you learn this, I, I call it the mother's milk of metaphysics, thoughts are things. Um, everybody learns that. I don't care whether they're spiritualists, new thought practitioners, uh, uh, Catholic school children. We, I remember we, we, we got that somehow, that thoughts were supposed to be things, but that kind of is dropped um, in our lap. And we don't meditate upon that too much. And we don't really evolve that thought. And so what happens is we, we, we forget, we forget. And so we need people like Florence Scovel Shin and, and Ernest Holmes and, and, and Charles and Ethel Fillmore of Unity, for example, to remind us, to help us remember, to take those divergent parts and remember, put it back together and say, wait a minute, um, <clears throat> thoughts are things, or, or to put it probably a little bit more 
uh, practically. They are the they are the animate power, if you will, behind things. Yes. That it is what you uh, where uh, I don't know. Many years ago, in fact, we had him at, at Lilydale Assembly not that a couple years ago. Uh, uh, Redfield, um, the author of the Celestine Prophecy. Yeah. And if you, that's another author, ironically, ridiculously simple book, ridiculously simple, and yet unbelievably profound. Because the one thing, um, I'll be a, a spoiler alert, they'll never have to sell another Celestine Prophecy again. The core of the Celestine Prophecy is where intention goes, energy must flow. Right. And if you can wrap your head around that and run with it, well, forget run, let's start walking first and then <laughs> run with it. it, you will begin to see that everything in your experience and expression in this, what feels like a three-dimensional experience, um, you know, again, we, we acknowledge that we are spiritual beings who have chosen to have a human experience. But in, in this, what, a, what feels like a three-dimensional experience, everything is a res, ultimately a result of what we have accepted and allowed in our conscious mind is ultimately processed uh, and, and replicated in the unconscious mind. And what Florence is striving to do, and what all new thought practitioners are striving to do, is help us to reconcile that there is a super conscious mind. Yes. What some yes. will call the Christ mind, remembering that it is not Christ like, you know, it's, Christ was not Jesus's last name. Christ is, means the anointed one, or in, in our interpretation, the anointed consciousness. It's a very poetic yes. way of saying your highest best self, or as uh, quantum physicians would probably, I would hope might tend to agree with me, uh, it is that God particle at the very core of our being. It is our uh, eternality. <clears throat> so back in this time, you've got people who are beginning to get that and get mm -hmm. that in a very deep way. However, it's, it's like with any teaching or any skill set, <clears throat> you have to make this practical first. Um, it doesn't matter what the uh, lofty theological and philosophical ideas are. It has, the rubber has to hit the road. You have to appeal to the fundamental hopes, dreams, needs, and desires of every every person and when she began to write we alluded to it just a little while ago what she was doing was saying okay uh this is what um uh this is the proposition this is the theory this is the concept oh and by the way this you know a lady came to me from topeka and she was looking to uh establish uh you know she needed she had a great need uh, and no way to fulfill it. Right. And Those are words that she uses yes. about things and situations. People would come to her in great financial need, relationship need, future need. And she knew the words that were needed at that particular moment, the affirmational uh, words that needed to be stated at that particular time. And I think she ultimately became kind of like their agreement partner in that. Um there is a there was many years ago and they still exist they're called mastermind groups and what the mastermind concept was and i believe it was started by a unity minister and what the mastermind concept was exactly what you're saying that that you you buddy up with someone who is your uh support in a way, it, it almost it sometimes feels like what uh, people who go through a, a recovery process uh, go through. They need someone who will be their uh, spiritual spine when they need it most. And likewise, they will be there for that other person. 
And mm -hmm. so there, you know, your point is extremely uh, on point uh, that, that, um, that if we're going to reconcile ourselves, that we have to have if um, a new thought. In other words, uh, uh, that if uh, you're, how do I put this? Uh, if you, there's an old expression, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if you take a long, hard look at the human condition, um, we do that better than you could imagine that we do anything. We, I think we, it's a matter of what and what thoughts are you choosing to entertain exactly. at that particular moment. Yeah. And it part is, of that new thought yeah. movement was the understanding of, of calling the divine infinite intelligence, which is something that spiritualists do too. And exactly. really tapping into infinite intelligence and the amazing abundance and love that is ever present for a person. So that I think that's part of the core part of that. And then that visioning process, it's, it's a replacement of old negative thought beliefs that Florence even alludes to them in, in the books. She talks about race thought, and that's human race thought. The idea that uh, you know we as humans, as human race, that we can't have we can't have things that there's this limitation that there's this lack that is ever present and that we through sin and uh, bad things we deserve uh horrible things to happen in our life and so there, that's that's a really important thing that that she and others of the new thought movement changed with this I, that you could really embrace the divine concept and step into that belief system and uh, through that all abundance would flow be it love uh you know financial that you would have enough and more they they spent an enormous amount of time and she was no different and again in my personal and professional opinion she did it better than 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 quite a few of them yeah. uh the the notion that you don't get what you deserve you do not get what you deserve. That's the law of karma. You get what, what is what is yours by divine right if you are in that mode. Yeah, you you get in a sense in a sense what you expect, and so there is a where where they really veer away and and sometimes people say, well, you know, um, this is you know, is this for everybody or just a you know, is it just for Christians or is it just for you know, other religious traditions. No, it is for everybody. The history of the time, the history of the time was such where there is an emphasis on a Judeo-Christian orientation. But I've, I've talked to people and I've seen documentaries and so forth about her, her life and other New Thought practitioners who have said, whoa, wait a minute. Um, you know, you, you function within the framework of how, you know, where you found yourself. Um, so a lot of it may be, um, uh, may appear to have, you know, when they use the term Christed consciousness, it could be the Buddha consciousness. It could be the, uh, it, it, it's the universal infinite intelligence. The, the point is not to get mogged, <clears throat> pardon me, mired down with, um, with those, with that aspect of the terminology. I think that's a really important point, Ron, but because to, yeah. it, there's a lot of the Bible that's listed in here and that actually has helped me understand the Bible more. Yes. But people back then knew their Bible. Well, and look, they, they we, didn't have, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't yeah. have Facebook back in 1848. We, I sound like I was there. Could be. Um, people didn't have Facebook and they didn't have computers and, and iPhones and all this. They, the, the book that was there, there is not, it wasn't an accident that the family Bible was the family Bible. There weren't um, other than some periodicals and some newspapers. You didn't have the proliferation of even the printed word uh, to the extent that the vast majority of people could enjoy and, and, and learn from things. So yeah, but but as you just said, it is more of a 
movement of consciousness, a movement of awareness, and where they veered away from what I will call traditional orthodox theology, traditional um, <clears throat> what spiritualism would call the old religious uh, tendencies, is an emphasis going back to you know Celestine prophecy of recognizing that where intention goes, energy flows. Yeah. And that as all metaphysicians have come to understand, you cannot be double-minded. You cannot contemplate so-called good and so-called evil simultaneously. It will either be one or the other. And she knew this, and, and so many like her knew this. In fact, she's quoted as saying, and, and this goes back to um, one of the students of Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker said, God, however, you know, God is perceived, is not the author of sin, sickness, or death. Uh, Florence said, evil is unreal and leaves no stain. Evil is unreal and leaves no stain. It is there because there, there is this thing that needs to be addressed. It is not just what we are affirming, but there is what they're what are called denials. So there's affirmation and denials. In order, you have to identify a problem in order to eliminate that problem. So if you know in your consciousness you have a proclivity toward negativism or a proclivity toward being, quote, afraid, <coughs> excuse me afraid of, quote, evil, you need to acknowledge that. You need to say, okay, I deny that in my consciousness. I deny that in my life. And then replace it with a new thought, which of course is the underlying abundance, goodness. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is poetic, but I've always tried to um, uh, encourage uh, myself and, 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 and others to acknowledge that whatever your concept of God is, the most important thing you can do is always recognize, as a Jesus did, and, and others before him and others after him, that God is ever for us, by God's nature, can never be against us. Therefore, God is good and only good, and as its experience and expression in physical form, for we too are the Word, God, made flesh, that we are good and have every expectation of the goodness that is God that is also demonstrated in the, in, in, in the world of effects, the physical world. Yeah. What she knew and what all metaphysicians know, and this is extremely important, uh, and I, I go back because uh, I'll go back to the, the to a Christian concept. When Jesus taught, "Ask and ye shall receive," what a lot of people do not pick up on is the way it should be stated, and the way it should be interpreted is, "Ask believing, and ye shall receive." Yes. Many people ask, you know. Uh, and, and as St. Paul used to say, if ye pray and do not receive, ye pray amiss. And, and that's basically because what you're all too often, because they still have that internalization, that endless loop in their subconscious mind about evil, unworthiness, uh, not accepting the, the, the positive flow of goodness in our lives by its, its inherent nature, which is our inherent nature. And what happens is they, the, what they desire either does not happen in any way, shape, or form, or if it does happen, they lose it. And they lose it because you can't hold on to what you don't actually own. And we own everything in consciousness first. And then everything else falls into place. It's such a core element of what Florence explains in her books. I'm so glad you brought that out today because people need to know that 
that's what it, a lot of this hinges on that belief, that faith. She talks about faith and that, you know, like in the Bible, when they say, well, it's not we, here we are in the desert, we need water. And so what do they decide to do? They start to dig ditches. And the reason they're going to do this is because it will rain. And all of a sudden they have dug their ditches and it rains. And here comes providence. Here comes what they need at that particular time. And so you have to sometimes dig a ditch that, you, you know, not knowing whether it's going to happen or not, you know, there, you could you could be in that that mi the midst of it, but you still have to do. There's that law of preparation right. that Florence is very very clear about that you prepare, you know, mentally and physically, and what you do those that mode of of belief and prayer and action really have to work together. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> because. All too often, and I hate to say this, we are accused of this, meaning new thought practitioners, as well as spiritualists and so forth. We are accused more often than not of just, oh, this is all wishful thinking, or as it's been referred to kind of tongue-in-cheek, wishcraft. And nothing could be further from the truth. It is yeah. a misunderstanding, sometimes a misinterpretation of the teaching. And the teaching is asking with the expectation that it is already done. Yes. Now, if you, if you, if people who are, you know, struggling with this, I always tell them, look, if you look at the, 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 the Christian gospel in its orthodoxy, the work of, of Jesus was done, therefore done in a metaphysical sense for all of eternity. So the, 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 the Orthodox Christian accepts their salvation, whether they were born in 1848, 1948, or 2058. Uh, you know, it's a metaphysical concept. And, it's, and within the context of New Thought, it's the, it, it's the same thing. All of your goodness, not some, not most, all of your goodness or godness is available to you right here, right now, eternally. Yes. Not There's no timeline because in the spiritual dynamic of that which we call life, time and space is irrelevant. It is, it's an illusion. So there is only, and Eric Tolle speaks to this, it's you know this whole function of being in the eternal now, being in the present. Mm -hmm. That is something we desperately, desperately need in the human condition now <clears throat> because as i've said on a number of occasions we're either tortured by our past confounded by our present and tantalized by our future and florence says no 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 there is a power in the universe I'm, oh actually i'm quoting dr holmes there is a power in the universe greater than you are and you can use it Yes. And, and she came obviously before him and said, yes, I, exp I, am, I am the goodness of God. Therefore, I expect the goodness of God. Now, some call this blasphemy um, or, or, and, and, and find it, you know, the height of selfishness. And I'm thinking, no. Um, uh, Jesus said, love yourself and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't love yourself, if you can't accept yourself, if you cannot accept that you are a beloved uh, son or daughter of God, to, to again, wax poetic here, if I may, uh, then what you truly expect of yourself, and in, in many, many, many cases, a sense of or an acceptance of unworthiness, or that we are somehow lacking um, and, and we deserve to be punished, not rewarded. Is it any accident or coincidence that we have the kind of world that we have today and have had for many hundreds of years before that? No. And so <clears throat> when she started writing, and, and if I may, um, uh, uh, these are great points that you're making, Ron. I think Thank it's important. You. Thank you. Because, no, it's... 
there's so much we can talk about with this. Well, uh, but what I what I if oh I'm sorry to make. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do is maybe share a few of the things that she wrote. Um, probably the the book that she is most remembered for, and it's it's in your um, I'll call I'll call what you carry in your mom bag as your mother's Bible um, <laughs> uh, is the game of life and how to play it. And that was written, I believe, in 1925. Yes. And one of the most powerful quotes in it, if I may share that with our audience, is the game of life is a game of boomerangs. Our thoughts, deeds, and words return to us sooner or later with astounding accuracy. Mm -hmm. Okay, astounding accuracy. And <coughs> I love the fact, and we've alluded to it on a couple of, uh, in a couple of instances, that she's so readable and she uses terms. Um, she understands that, that everybody has a primary, I use the phrase, locus of focus, that we have kind of a prime, you know, I'm a, I'm a Trekkie. We have a prime directive in our consciousness. And depending upon what that prime directive is, that kind of outpictures into our day-to-day -day experience. And she calls that prime directive or that locus of focus, um, the kingpin thought. Yes, 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 and yes. That is, and that is the thought tendency that Holmes talks about or the thought patterns that we tend to, um, that we tend to uh, embrace. And, you know, it's, you know, I think one of the reasons that I found it so, uh, I want to use, <laughs> it's not easy. I think I struggle with this like everyone else does, because this is such a dynamic way of doing things. Uh, and I tell people if, if it were easy, I mean, simplistic to, you know, then everybody would be doing it. And obviously, you have to be open hearted and open minded to this, to try it, to actually see its validity, its practical application. And I think one of the reasons it became so powerful to me is it spoke to one of the principles of modern spiritualism, and that is personal responsibility. Yes. That we are personally responsible for our happiness or unhappiness. We are neither rewarded nor punished. We are co-creators with infinite intelligence. Infinite intelligence is the raw energy, the, the Holy Spirit, the, the dynamic mover of, of anything and everything. It is all that it is. <clears throat> and we as uh, conscious expressions of that infinite intelligence are here to learn to um, utilize that energy for the purpose of the most positive, creative, wonderful things we can, and we will get whatever we believe we deserve. And so when she came out with uh, these kind of thoughts, it, it was um, taking what I call you know, high church metaphysics, uh, the kind you would see from an Emma Curtis Hopkins, let's say, in high mysticism, which is an excellent book, by the way, and, <clears throat> and putting it down to the, uh, to the plane of, of uh, a simple yet dynamically profound understanding that you've got to change some of these thoughts, this kingpin thought. Mm -hmm. What, who are you? What do you really believe? And what does that belief ultimately motivate you to do? Yes. Um, these are things that, that unfortunately a lot of people do not think about because if you, Willa, were to go to one of your clients, and I would encourage you to do this from time to time, you'll, you'll be fascinated with the result. If you ask them, does life occur to you or does life occur through you? I would say that at least seven or eight out of 10 will tell you life occurs to them as though there are outside forces they have no control over. 
And as you alluded to earlier in, in terms of Florence's ability to take, for example, like the Bible and talk about digging trenches and looking for water, the recognition that, as Dr. Ernest Holmes used to say, there is no spot where God is not. And that if we truly believe, as many people claim to believe, which I unfortunately see differently, that, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> if all things, not some things, not most things, but if all things are possible with God, then all things are possible with you. All things are possible. So we don't, uh, one of the things that she, she did such fantastic work with was showing that you don't need to have a million dollars to invest in a business. Uh, you don't need to have, you don't need to, to, to do what we in, in, as human beings do. You don't need to plot, plan, and scheme. All you need to do is have the right intention, the right attitude, which hopefully is an attitude of gratitude, act as if it already is. Because in consciousness, that which is non-tangible, that which we cannot see, that which we declare and decree already is. And so it doesn't become a matter of getting God to do something that you apparently cannot do for yourself. It is accepting and allowing what God, infinite intelligence, has already said. So, what would you like today? And, and creating the kind of life, and if you don't like what you've created, change it. But it all goes right back to what's happening between your ears. And I think that's a really important point for people to understand about Florence and the way she expresses things. It really is the divine nature to have what is yours by divine right, divine right timing, uh, an order, and that that can work and flow. But you are also in the flow of God's will with all of this. And to network with other people to make your, your what you vision appropriately for yourself and others it does involve listening to your intuition. So she talks about intuition. She talks about following up on your hunches, the divine right timing of, of, of those intuitive leads that we are given by God. And that if we choose to dismiss that and those divine hunches and intuitive leads, we usually head in the wrong direction. And right. the, uh, an absolute essence of this is that law of synchronicity that we that synchronicities will happen and that you will connect with the people that you need to but that mindset so that you can have perhaps a more spiritual reaction to what is occurring is really essential because sometimes people are uh shut the door to their good they will say i want this why isn't it here already it's almost like they ordered it from amazon it should be on my doorstep well there's some necessary components are you listening to those divine hunches that say, okay, now you need to go talk to so-and-so or you need to go to such and such a place so that you can align and meet up with the people and situations that are for your greater good. That's something that she, throughout her books, really, that's, that's a, a, a major component of making this work in the affirmational world. And another point, I know at times going so fast for us, uh, but I want to make sure I said it, that that forcing a vision is um, never what you're supposed to do. This is something that you have to, that intuition has to allow that vision to come upon you. When you try to say, I want this, this isn't about going to the McDonald's window and ordering a particular thing. It doesn't, it's not quite what this is about. This is about saying, okay, God, I, I'm going to phrase things in such a way so that I can allow for my greatest good to occur at this particular moment. And then you are embraced but in, in that flow of God's will and you travel that current, that energetic current, and it takes you where you need to go. What you've just described is what they call in the Bible, righteous thinking. Yes. And, 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 and I think it's appropriate in these last few minutes that we have together, we talk about that for a minute. 
you know, we're living in a, in a, in a very, I, if I hear this word again, I'll scream, but it is the truth, unprecedented times. I mean, between the pandemic of COVID-19, economic realities that are the, the, the best word I can use is frightening uh, and so forth. And we, we are all at the mercy of our own fear and anxiety <clears throat> because again, we're hardwired it seems to expect and allow the negative as though we consider that our portion, what we deserve. And what Florence is saying, and what so many others have said in concert with Florence is no, 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 no. You do not have to accept this. You, you have to accept it as a tangible experience. I mean, this is not, again, um, you know, let's ignore reality. I mean, if I cut my finger, I've cut my finger, okay? That's, too, sometimes people go a little far afield with this way of thinking as, as so many other ways of thinking. But the point is, we can look beyond, as it says in scripture, and as it says in New Thought and, so, and Spiritualism, look beyond the appearance, look beyond the so-called reality, and recognize that there is a greater reality with a capital R. And that is what you talked about earlier, is that intuition. That is when we are in touch with and prayerfully and respectfully and humbly in tune with our highest best self, God, infinite intelligence. And that is the kind of guidance, uh, you know, our brethren in the Native American traditions from thousands of years ago, when they talked about being in touch with the great spirit, uh, they weren't whistling into the wind. It was a reality. It wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't a, a poetic way of expression they had a sense of the interconnectedness, the balance, the order, the ebb and flow of all of life. We are invited by life, moment to moment, day by day, to reconnect to that so that we not only prepare for the greater life that is to come, as we know there will be for all of God's children, but that we can live a more meaningful, a more abundant, a satisfying and happy life for ourselves, because that is our divine heritage. It always has been, ever will be. And a <clears throat> couple of things, if I may just very briefly touch on, because you were right, I, I haven't gone through half my notes here, but if, <laughs> if, if, your, if your audience, and now mine for a moment or two, <laughs> um, would like to, um, one of the things I recommend very strongly because it'll help you kind of, again, use this, uh, hopefully this uh, program as a jump point to developing a, a, a relationship with Florence Scovelshin, go on YouTube. You will find an enormous amount of, of um, video uh, an audio about Florence, about New Thought, but specifically Florence, because I couldn't think of a, I mean, I think, you know, eh, Emmett Fox, amazing writer. I, I love him to pieces, but I couldn't think of a better writer and a better influencer of consciousness for the average person than Florence Scovel Shin. And I mean that yes. from the bottom of my, my heart. Um, Probably the best work she did, uh, according to many, is The Secret Door of Success mm -hmm. uh, in 1940. The Secret Door of Success. And of course, the, the perennial, your word is your wand. Yes. Uh, and that was in 1928. Um, and we should mention, you know, uh, this was written around the time of the Great Depression. And so this is extremely... A, a, pivotal time for people in in terms of feeling lack in a severe severe way and i i do believe that florence and other new thought writers and 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 other people as well with these thoughts helped them to really transcend what was going on with them and we can use those words today uh, if we wish if we wish we can really use those words to grow through our own difficulties 
I I will share one last thing because <clears throat> the clock on the wall looked like it's falling off the wall. Um, <laughs> I found something the other day, and and I would love very much this to be kind of a a holiday message to all of us. Uh, I mean, I always tell people whenever I share like this, I'm basically preaching or teaching to myself. You're just my witnesses because I need to hear this more than most folks. <laughs> I'm I'm a student and 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 life helped me. I, you know, I, it it it's it. I'm I'm grateful for 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 being exposed it's to the many spiritual I, food. You you have to eat yeah. spiritual food. Yeah. But I found something, and and this was written uh, probably a number of years ago. Uh, you know, we talk about Lilydale and some of the contemporaries. I mean, one of the things that I really uh, loved uh, was by the the late great uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, mm -hmm. and he wrote, "You will see it when you believe it, not you will believe it when you see it." But he had a, he has a contemporary that we're all familiar with, Dr. Deepak Chopra, who is not only an, an extraordinarily uh, gifted medical and Ayurvedic physician, but also one of the best metaphysicians in, in the world today. And I want to leave you, <clears throat> this with you. It takes as little as 1% of a population to create positive change. I believe that if 100 million people underwent a personal transformation in the direction of peace, harmony, laughter, love, kindness, and joy, the world, the entire world, would be transformed. And so with that, I wish all of you a truly blessed holiday season, and I thank you for the opportunity to share with you. It's, it's been my honor and my privilege. Oh, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Ron. You know, that power of thought is, that Florence and so many of the others that have gone before <coughs> us, that lives at, in, infinitely through, through us and around us. And I think it's really been important to share that. I well, want to make sure we oh, mention your event that's coming up. Well, one, one, here we go. One last thing. One last thing. One last thing. I feel like Columbo. <laughs> uh, this is one more thing. Um, um, it's important to note that 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 you know you'd mentioned this, uh, Willa, and, and again you really struck the nail right on the head when Florence was at her the height of her powers, her her influence and her ability to help and to heal, it was the midst of, of a horrible, horrible time in American history, world history, the Great Depression. Well, unfortunately, history in many instances has a tendency of repeating itself. And as they say, if you don't learn from history, you run the risk of repeating it. And what better gift you can give yourself than jumping on that YouTube and familiarizing yourself with the works and teachings of Florence Scovel Shin uh, so that we can be part of the solution that we're all so desperately seeking rather than to maintain ourselves as merely a part of the problem. Um, we are what we have been seeking all these years. Florence will help you uh, as she has helped so many before us if you just open your heart and more, more importantly, open your mind. And open um, your book, open and, your book. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. And get yourself a mother's Bible that, you know, because that's got four of her books. Uh, yeah. These books are ridiculously inexpensive when you compare Very the twenty nine ninety nine and so forth from so many other authors now. Well, I I can go in here and find <coughs> gems. I find gems all the time, and, and I read it yeah. again and again, and I it just and, it keeps filtering in. I'm so I think I found this. It's either two thousand, maybe it was two thousand seven or eight. I can't remember now, and. It was a, a, a few years after that that Louise Hay found uh, exactly for it. And, and cured then, herself, and and Louise cured herself of terminal. May I say it again? Terminal cancer, using the principles she learned. Now, 
obviously I'm not a doctor and I would not presume to say you're going to be able to cure anything and everything. That's not what I'm saying, but this is powerful and it, it at the very, very least will help you in any situation uh, attain a consciousness uh, that will bring you greater clarity, greater spiritual awareness. Uh, and, and what more could we ask for as a, as a holiday gift than that? Um, one last thing, at, there's a fellow by the name of Neville, N-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and his last name was Goddard, G-O-D-D-A-R-D. And he has an excellent, excellent book. It's in that same vein. It's called At Your Command. And that was written in 1939. And enough of that, because I could go on for hours. Um, well, great resources. Uh, I want to talk about the events that Ron and I have have going on. Uh, right. Real quickly, I the month of January, I have set up some wonderful classes for all of you to take. Uh, my first one, that first Monday in January, will be on positive affirmations. We're going to talk about how to write them. And a lot of what we'll use is based on Florence, but also other things that uh, other are the things I've read, experienced myself. I've crafted affirmations for myself and I've taught this class before. So you can bring an affirmation and work on it uh, during that class and really see how you can shape the word specifically for what is needed at this time. Uh, so I do have that. I wanna make sure I mention that and you can find more about that on on uh, my website and also my Facebook page. But Ron has something coming up even before that on December 27th. Yep. He will be uh, the, the inspirational speaker at the Sunday morning church service for the Church of the Living Spirit here in Lilydale. So you, you can go onto the Church of the Living Spirit Facebook page and tune in to Ron at 1030 on, on Sunday, December 27th. And every year, I don't know, for however, however many years it's been, Ron does uh, a, a bowl burning, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny, <laughs> but it, it really works with uh, getting things set for the new year. So do you want to tell them about that real quickly, Ron? It, it sounds like I'm Julia Child. Today we're going to burn a bowl. No. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm channeling Julia Child. God, it's come to this. Um, <laughs> On the 27th of December, and again, this will be, uh, it's, it's very important, unless we hear different, which I tend to doubt, it will be virtual, okay? It's the first year we've had to, due to COVID-19, uh, do this virtually, but the, the ceremony of the bowl burning is very simple. It's an opportunity for people to tangibly <clears throat> take a piece of paper and jot down things that no longer serve them and things that they do not wish in their in their lives based on the metaphysical principle it's a denial out of my consciousness out of my life and you light that piece of paper and you put it in the bowl hence the term burning bowl and it's a symbolic again it's not wishcraft it's a symbolic gesture a tangible way of expressing an inner state of awareness. It is powerful. It is meaningful. Uh, I have never, and I mean this sincerely, had someone come up to me after this service and say, yeah, that was nice, but what do you do for an encore? Uh, it, it's a very uh, significant part of my spiritual growth. Um, it was originally taught to me by the late, uh, wonderful Reverend Shirley Calkins Smith many, many years ago, and I've utilized it in so many different uh, spiritualism, religious science. Uh, I mean, I've utilized it in many traditions, and it, it, it works um, wonders and, because it helps you to break away from that which no longer serves you. So again, as Willa mentioned, look on the Church of the Living Spirit website um, or Facebook page, they should have all the information you could possibly uh, want. And I hope uh, in quotation marks to see you there. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say real quickly, usually <coughs> have the negatives that you're releasing, but then you're also what is positive. Absolutely. I, I want to make sure that got mentioned too. Re remember I said earlier, 
you can't hold a positive and a negative thought simultaneously. So you release the negative in order to give room, so to speak, for all of the wonderful things that you now accept and allow that have always been there, but now you are participating in the process of saying yes to life rather than, nah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a, a wonderful service that you do every year. And I'm so glad that you'll be able to do it at least virtually. So people, you know, all over the world can tune in uh, on that particular day for you. And uh, of course, stay tuned uh, for uh, more Wednesdays with Willa and, uh, you know, sign up for the positive affirmations class so that I can help you hone uh, your words and get them to where they need to be. Uh, being a student of Florence has helped me enormously in my own affirmations and in my own life and understanding of spiritual natural law. And we're going to talk about that in the class. So thank you everyone for your kind attention today. Thank you, Ron, for sharing. I love talking with you uh, about lots of subjects, but it was just wonderful to talk about Florence, one of my favorite people that is still helping me in my life today. You bet. You bet. All right. My Thanks, privilege. Everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. And God bless and happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.